Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on how to pre-think assumptions. My name is Rajat Sudhan. I'm one of the co-founders of eGMAT, and I'm going to be your main host today. In this webinar, we'll help you learn this skill called pre-thinking. It's one of the most important skills if you want to uh, ace uh, uh, GMAT critical reasoning or if you want to get to that score of 730 or higher. By the way, while we are here, let's kind of figure out what is your, uh, your, your target GMAT score. Let's get that over here. What's your target GMAT score? And again, forgive me if there's anyone who's, who's lower than 600. I don't have that option here. But but uh, other than that, I think for, for a majority of you, upwards of 90% of you, you should have all the relevant options that you need. All right, with that, the, based on the data that I have over here, and I have data from about 170 folks over here. Um, but the biggest group is in the 730 to 750 bucket, uh, two equally sized groups in the 710, 720, and 760 plus buckets, and about 12% uh, of you are in that uh, 600 to 700 bucket. Now, with that, let's kind of get into the crux of this webinar. It's a fairly application-focused webinar, so, so we did expect you to have some sort of a foundation on assumptions. Um, if you don't have it, we will spend the first 20 minutes going through it. Uh, but, but if you have that foundation, you're going to find that throughout this webinar, uh, you, you just get it. You, uh, and, and the reason why I say that, uh, that you just get it is because in this webinar, as we go towards the the, uh, uh, the second two thirds so, so the, uh, of this webinar, so once we after post the first 33%, we're going to follow some fairly sophisticated logic. And, 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 and you need to be at a certain um, level of comprehension to be able to, to follow that logic. And, and, and once you go through these initial video files, you get to that level of comprehension. But if you have not, these video files, or, or we call them as HTML5 files, are, are a part of your, your free trial. Log into your free trial, go through them, get that personalized feedback that these files give you. We have also some upcoming free webinars. We have a free webinar on GMAT algebra. That's tomorrow. If inequalities absolute value uh, uh, bother you, this is the webinar to attend. And, uh, and, and, and in this webinar, we go from the very simple questions to the most challenging ones. And we demonstrate to you that, hey, uh, stuff such as inequalities and absolute value is, is a piece of cake if you follow certain methods. Then um, for those of you who are aiming to score high, which is 700 or higher, or even actually if you in that 600 to 700 bracket, we have a free GMAT strategy webinar in which we help each one of you create your personalized study plan and then tell you uh, beyond that personalized study plan, how should you study to make sure that you, you hit the, the, the metrics uh, that you need to get to, to your target score and, 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 and how do you track whether you're, you're studying properly to, to hit that, those metrics. Uh, that's, this, that's next Saturday, so a week from now. Now, um, how many of you are thinking about taking the online GMAT. Say yes if you're thinking about taking the online GMAT. Uh, online GMAT is the same as GMAT at home. Okay, so about half of you are thinking of taking the online GMAT. Um, and then the other piece is, how many of you are aware that uh, that you can now use a, a physical whiteboard, which is like a real whiteboard when you take the GMAT at home? How many of you are aware of that? OK. So, so for those of you who are not aware, you instead of, in addition to, I shouldn't say instead of, in addition to you to having that on-screen digital whiteboard, you now have the option of using a, a real whiteboard, which is a whiteboard on your table when you take the test from home. Uh, this is a recent announcement that the GMAT made or MBA.com made. And then um, on Monday, which is two days from now, we have a YouTube live webinar in which we'll talk about uh, uh, this, this physical whiteboard with, with, with Seher Khanna, who's uh, the marketing manager at GMAX. So she's a, an MBA.com representative. And she's going to talk about uh, uh, you know both online and in-central GMAT. Why? Because send, the test centers are opening as well. And, and then how it, it, it overcomes that uh, uncertainty, how the online GMAT now overcomes an uncertainty. And then many of you have 
these questions about what happens if my internet connection goes away and, and so on and so forth. Why is it that the online GMAT allows me to send my GMAT scores to 20, 30, 40 different schools free of charge, whereas I have to pay 25 bucks for, for every school and so on and so forth. Um, how valid is the online GMAT score? So she's going to talk about all of those questions here. If you have not registered for this one, this is on Monday, 15th of June on our YouTube channel. With that, let's go right into the webinar room, or we or we call this as a webinar pane uh, over here. And the screen should have changed for you. You should be seeing uh, the the screen which says "Pre-thinking for assumptions." Uh, can you guys see the screen? All right, most of you can see the screen, that's wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna go through three parts in this webinar. In the first part, I'm gonna tell you about six minutes about your, your, your overall MBA and, 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 and a personalized study plan. And, um, and, and again, we talked about uh, how do you build your personalized study plan. I'm gonna talk about, uh, give you a, a, a brief overview of what that online study plan could look like and then uh, in that webinar, we'll go on with regards to executing on that. Then we'll go right into the crux of this webinar, and uh, and then towards the end, um, you know, if you have questions which do not pertain to 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 critical reasoning but pertain to other aspects of your GMAT preparation or your MBA, we usually reserve about twenty minutes towards the end, and and in which we can deal with those questions. So so two things that I want to tell you about about EGMAT is at EGMAT we we focus a lot of our learning on that private tutoring based approach where where uh, we give a typical EGMAT student uh, about 300 times feedback, which is personalized to, to, to his or her learning during the course of his engagement with us. And this feedback's built because we built technology to give you this feedback. When you look at most of the other courses, you, you kind of have this book-based architecture where you get very little feedback uh, uh, while, uh, while, while, while learning, whereas with us, you get upwards of 300 points. And just to tell you an evidence of that feedback, uh, uh, let's kind of talk about how we help you create your study plan. Okay, so when you think about creating a, a study plan, if your goal is to get to a high GMAT score, and then this is any score 700 or or above, you've got to do a few things. One is you create a path to your goal. So depending on what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, you you look at those and, and really say, okay, how will I reach to reach my score of 730, 740, or 710, or or whatever that score is, then. When, when you do that, you can identify certain gaps where you have certain areas where you have major gaps and, and there you learn the concepts uh, uh, that you need to learn. Why? Because these are those areas where you need that major investment. But just merely learning the concepts isn't enough. You also need to know how to apply those concepts. And then you need to get so good at applying those con concepts that you attain a level of mastery um, that, that you hit that score of 720. So, so. So let's see how would you go about defining a path to your goal if you're someone who's starting at that score of 600 and want to get to that score of 720. So the first thing you've got to do, it's essentially a very simple three-step process. The first thing you've got to do is define where you currently are. Define what we call as your, your starting abilities in, in five different areas, three in verbal and, and, and two in quant. Um, so you get your SCCR and RC ability and then your arithmetic and algebra ability. Just a quick poll over here. How many of you, I'm going to put in a yes, no, have know those five abilities today to say, hey, I know what my ability or percentile score in SCCR and RC is. I know what my percentile score in arithmetic and algebra is today. How many of you know those starting abilities today? I have about 320 students in the webinar. Let's get to at least 200 responses. The question is, how many of you know your starting abilities? And it's not your quant and verbal scores. It is your abilities in in five subsections because your quantum verbal scores don't tell you much but sc cr rc arithmetic algebra okay how many of you know those about 30 percent or about 40 percent of you know those so the first thing is to, to to get those abilities and how do you get those abilities 
Um, there are two ways to, to get those abilities. One is you take an incentive GMAT. The second is you take an eGMAT mock test, which is the world's only mock test that gives you those abilities. For those of you who have already taken the GMAT once and have seen the ESR, you know what these abilities are because your ESR gives you those. Uh, but, but other than that, even the official mocks no longer uh, give you those. Um, you only get them using a Sigma X mock. So for those of you who are looking for you know, the world's most accurate diagnostic, which, which gives insights that you won't get anywhere else, this is the mock to take. Okay. The second thing is, you've got to set your milestones as to how will you reach your your target score and that's where we built an AI driven tool called GMAT planner uh, which which allows each one of you to uh, to create your own personalized study plan what does it do it takes your content verbal scores at a very high level then it it, it tells you what should be your target quantum target verbal score should uh, be to get to that score of 720 again if you want to get to the 760 it will give you a different recommendation if you are someone who's stronger in, in, in way stronger in verbal than it want it will give you a slightly different recommendation as well then it takes your starting abilities and 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 uh, and it gives you your target ability scores in sccr and rc based on these and then once you have that it, it creates this study plan for you where it says hey an arithmetic these are your starting abilities um, over here in arithmetic you have 59 percentile you need about 1.4 weeks to hit your target ability over here uh, in, in, in sentence correction you can, you're starting at 50th percentile we got this from your sigma x mark you need uh, to get to that 89 percentile you need about 2.1 weeks and this is based on what you tell the platform with regards to the number of hours you're going to put in Um, and then it creates a study plan for you where again it takes into account uh, how many hours are you going to study during the weekday during the weekend and it tells you when can you actually take the test okay um, again for those of you who need help in, in, in building your study plan you can go to gmatplanner.com and, and you can go build your study plan so so um, Yes, one Sigma X mark is available for a free of charge. A GMAT planner consultation is also available free of charge. You can go there and, and we, we the GMAT planner, a few slots are only, only a few slots are there. Uh, but but uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Sigma X mark, uh, because it's something that you take on your own, that's something that, uh, that you, you know, you can, you can take up. There are unlimited slots for that. But yeah, GMAT planner, we give out about 20 slots a week. That's on a first come, first serve basis. Okay. Um, and again, for those of you who are planning to take the online GMAT, you have dates only till the 17th of July. And if you want to understand uh, what are some of those study plans that help you get there, here are a few um, success stories where you have those study plans outlined. With that, if you want to stay updated with all things UGMAT, you can connect with me on my LinkedIn account. I have upwards of 15,000 students connected over there. Um, so if you want to actually stay updated with all things UGMAT, if you want to connect with students at top B schools, this would be a good way for you to do that. All right, with that, let's start with the CR part of uh, our live session. Okay, so what's our agenda for today? We're going to go through the following approach we're going to understand how you look at cr questions today then we're going to do a pre-thinking exercise we're going to look at about three arguments uh, one simple two complex and then we're going to go through two full length questions um uh, two official questions both of these would be official again complex questions we'll solve these questions as a quiz we'll do a detailed review of these two questions you're going to apply pre-thinking we're going to apply the negation test and then um we're going to talk about uh, uh, what should you, what should be or should be approach uh, means how can you go about mastering pre-thinking post this webinar, where can you practice questions, where will you get good solutions and, 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 and how should you take on feedback. So at a very high level, we'll document how you prepare today. Then we'll recognize what's important to master assumption questions and in general, even though we'll focus our attention to just to assumption questions, um, you know, uh, Whatever we talk about today will be applicable to, to, to all argument-based questions and critical reasoning. And, and then we're going to create a plan for you to, to excel in CR. Okay. Um, 
So let's talk about your current approach to critical reasoning. And, I'm, uh, and, and, and before I do that, let me define what pre-thinking is. So pre-thinking is thinking of one potential assumption in your mind in 15 seconds before you start looking at answer choices. So, so let me just make sure I, I detail this out. So, um, and this is really important for you to, to, to understand what pre-thinking is. So an argument can have multiple assumptions and, and when you're pre-thinking, we're not looking at all those assumptions. Our goal is to, to make sure we come up with one potential, one good assumption over there. And why? Because if you're able to come up with one good assumption, we, we, we can prove to ourselves that, hey, we understand the logic that the author is using to arrive at the conclusion. Now, when you become a skilled pre-thinker, not today, not tomorrow, but in about five to seven days, uh, when you become a skilled pre-thinker, you should be able to do pre-thinking in about 15 seconds. And the last piece is pre-thinking needs to be done before you look at answer choices. If you start looking at answer choices, you can throw pre-thinking out of the window. Why? Because every answer choice in a CR question gives you new information. And the moment you, your brain's tarnished with that new information, pre-thinking actually starts to become very imprecise. And the reason why I want to make sure you understand this is why, because even though these terms existed uh, in, in, the, in, in the GMAT world uh, since eternity, uh, we people often confuse pre-thinking as predicting the answer. Even if you look on, on forums today, you'd say, hey, pre-thinking is the same as predicting what, what the answer is likely to be. No, this is not what pre-thinking is. Pre-thinking is about understanding the logic that the author is 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 is, uh, is, uh, is trying to 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 use to arrive at the conclusion okay um so don't think or don't take what pre-thinking as predicting the answer no uh, uh it is about understanding the logic okay so with that let's understand how do you solve a, an assumption question today which of the two approaches do you do you uh, use to solve an assumption question and then you're going to see two methodologies over there one is read the argument look at the answer choices do back and forth till you reach the final candidate the second is read the argument pre-think an assumption and then evaluate the answer choices referring to the argument only when needed All right, let's get a few more responses to this one. Just one second, guys. Uh, just one second. For some reason. Hold on. Just want to set the Q&A part right. Okay. Um, so I have a 50-50 split. 50% uh, of you use methodology one, the other 50 use methodology two. I mean, this is as precise as it gets when it gets when it comes to a 50-50 split. My goal today will be to make sure that more and more of you use methodology two. Now, if you use methodology two, if you use the pre-thinking approach, uh, the next question, which is which is there, is where do you spend? Uh, a good chunk of your time and, and again I'm not going to ask this question I'm going to tell you if you use methodology too uh, uh, you know what you're going to find and this is going to be a contrast for people who use methodology one where you do the back and forth if you use methodology two, this is where you spend a good chunk of the time but 40 percent of your time is, is spent reading and comprehending the argument why because if you spend a good chunk of the time reading and comprehending the argument uh, you don't need to spend as much time evaluating the answer choices. You can reject the answer choices without going back to, to the argument. Okay. Uh, now, there are three skills that we're going to focus on in this, um, in, in, in this session. The first skill is going to be the skill to visualize. What does visualize mean? You've got to, when you see a conclusion, you should be able to imagine what it uh, 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 what the, the author is trying to say in your own words. Also, we're going to visualize the answer choices in our own words. So the first part of, of, of this webinar, we're going to focus just on visualizing the conclusion. We won't have a whole lot of answer choices. In the second part, we're going to visualize the conclusion as well, as well as the answer choices over here. That's the first thing we're going to really do. So you're going to learn an, 
how to visualize this conclusion. Some of you may think it's very simple, but you're going to see the value of it as we, we get to the second part of the argument. Then the second thing that we're going to look at is focus on understanding the logic that, that the author uses to arrive at the conclusion. So a lot of people just read the argument, they think that they've understood the logic, but they don't focus on, on understanding that logic. We're going to spend some time doing this. Why? Because I want this to, 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 to become second nature for you. And the third thing that we will do is that we will learn to formally formulate what we call as a falsification question. So that was like a, a tongue twister. We will formally formulate the falsification question. And we're going to talk about what this falsification question is later on during the webinar. Okay. Um, and, and for those of you who say, I understand what critical reasoning is all about. I've seen all the concepts that are out there. I'm still not able to score. Uh, 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 60%, 70% percentile, or 90 percentile, you are folk, you are are faltering on one or more of these three things: visualizing the conclusion, understanding what the logic that the author is using, and formulating. And one thing I want to tell you is, async critical reasoning is is very different from async sentence correction in the sense that uh, in in sentence correction there are a ton of concepts that you've got to know, and and there is a way where if you become so familiar with sentence structures out there. Uh, and if you spend months and months studying those sentence structures that you could probably do well in sentence correction without using the logic. If you use a logic based approach, you'd probably do it in 15 days. If you kind of do the brute force approach, uh, you'd probably take six months, but but you know in six months it's possible and I've seen people do it. Uh, um, so the logic based approach probably 15 times as efficient, uh, but brute force is still possible. In critical reasoning, if you try using brute force, which is which is blind practice, you'd hit a wall at 50, 60 percentile. It's just not possible if you don't uh, learn how to comprehend and understand. And which is where a lot of people really say, hey, sentence correction is easy, but, but critical reasoning is, 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 is difficult. On the contrary, if you understand how to follow the logic-based approach, what you're going to find is you can ACR in five days. So, so sentence correction is, is, is takes longer to ace. Uh, with the logic-based approach, critical reasoning a lot shorter if you use a logic-based approach. Okay, so with that, let's kind of understand what an assumption is. And to do this, I'm going to uh, actually give you a very simple argument, an argument that I think is close to your heart, something that uh, that you probably think about day in and day out. So really, really simple argument, probably 500 level argument. And and I want you to tell me what is the author is you. All right, get those answers in. Again, put those answers in the short answer part. I have about 20 responses. I have about 43 responses. Let me broadcast your results. Please do not put your responses in the Q&A part. Put them in the short answer part, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, as, as most of you are doing. All right, what you see over here is most of you are able to get to the answer fairly easily. And, 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 and I'm going to end the poll, and, and I want to let you go through these responses. What you're going to find is that most of you, not everyone, but most of you have gotten the correct answer that you need a score of, of, uh, of higher than 500 to get to an Ivy League college. Let me ask this question, which is a more important question. Why do you think everyone was able to get to this answer? Or why do you think a majority of this, this, this class was able to get to this? It's a simple sentence. It was a one-liner, okay? What's e I can give you a one-liner where you will falter. But why do you think, what's, what does it mean that it was a simple sentence? This was a situation you can understand inside out. You've been thinking about that situation. For you, uh, you can relate to it, as, as some of you say. You know, For you to visualize what's going on in this argument is very simple. 
is very very simple and say very obvious i'm going to give you another parallel situation in in about 20 minutes which is also going to be almost equally obvious and and i can tell you about 70 percent of you will falter on that but the the key thing over here is that you're able to visualize this and 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 uh, and for the group over here, yes, this becomes a 500 level question because of the stats related to this. Now, even for this, even though you're almost there, even though you understand the logic, your wording of the assumption isn't precise, as precise as I would like it to be. It's almost there, it's not as precise. So let's kind of really see uh, 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 what's going on. And again, if you get the logic here, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this one. So, so, the author gives you a data on which says Joe scored 500 on the GMAT. And then, based on this, the, the author makes a claim. He says Joe will not get admission into an Ivy League college over here. Okay. And, and while doing that, the author makes a jump. And, 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 and from that score of 500 on the GMAT to no admission on an Ivy League college. And while doing that, what he's while do, making that jump, what the author assumes is that a score of 500. For someone like Joe, it's unacceptable to Ivy League colleges. And then the part which is really important over here is, is this one, which is, you know, the unacceptable piece. But there's a second part, which is also, I think, fairly important, which is for someone like Joe. Why? Because who is the conclusion about? Who is the conclusion about? The conclusion is about Joe, right? So the assumption also has to be linked to Joe. Because the author is not saying that the prince of Saudi Arabia will not get into an Ivy League college. What he's saying is Joe will not get into an Ivy League college. Okay. Um, and someone says, hey, it's about Chris. I think that guy who says it's about Chris is probably Chris. Um, so so one little point to, to know about it. But you guys get the logic, which is, which is really great. And, 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 and understand why you got the logic over here. Because the same way you got the logic for this one is what we're going to do for, for more challenging questions. Now with that, let's understand what an assumption is. So can you tell me what's the definition of an assumption? Can you type your answers over here? to be true the link between premise and conclusion uh, an unstated premise someone saying an assumption is something that's assumed yes it is uh, uh, but but that's not the definition of an assumption it's like saying what characteristics should an MBA have say so someone who, should, who has an MBA degree again not a great response to that uh, a prediction based on some facts, all right. Uh, it's not exactly an assumption. Uh, an assumption an assumption can be a fact too. It need not be a prediction. A new idea not stated in the passage. Okay, so some good definitions, a lot of definitions which are incomplete. And, and I would go to the extent to say woefully incomplete. Um, an assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. And that's really important when you think about this. So, you, I'm, I'm, I want you to get a pen and paper or a notepad if that's what you're more comfortable with and write this down. Why? Because you will make mistakes during this webinar and when you make mistakes, you're going to be confused. Why the hell did I make a mistake? I'm going to ask you to come back to this definition. And the moment you read this definition, you're going to understand why you made a mistake. Okay. So, so, so let's make sure we understand this. An assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be to be valid. Um, for those of you who really say an, an assumption is an unstated premise, yes, an assumption is an unstated premise, but every unstated premise is not an assumption. That's really important for you to know. Okay, so an assumption satisfies two characteristics. One is it provides new information, and new information means that information that you can't infer from 
from the factual part of the argument. And the second piece is that it, it must be true for the conclusion to hold true. And that's really important uh, that, 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 that an assumption satisfy that must be true condition. For those of you who, who are saying an assumption is an unstated premise, every unstated premise will not satisfy that must be true condition. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, and just to really explain what this means, let's take an example uh, in, in a more uh, physical sense. Okay, let's kind of consider this entire argument to be this house. And let's consider your conclusion to be this roof. And what you see over here is that you have these three pillars that are supporting this roof, which is my conclusion. Now, each of these three pillars uh, is premise. It's a premise. Okay, each of them is a supporting statement. A premise is nothing but a supporting statement. But now, not each one of them may not be an essential pillar, which means that, that hey, you probably can remove this guy and this guy, and, and the roof will still stay on as long as your central pillar is over here. And that central pillar is your assumption. The other two pillars, they are, they are premises, whether stated or unstated, but they are not essential. They are not they do not satisfy that must be true condition okay so so that essential pillar without which the, the roof cannot stay upright or without which the conclusion cannot stay valid is your assumption okay that's really important to understand all right so what does must be true mean in, in, in this way it means that if the information that the assumption provides is not true then the conclusion can no longer hold true or uh, or the conclusion will break down or there's a way to, to bring that roof down which kind of leads to that definition that the assumption must be true or must satisfy that must be true condition for the conclusion to be valid and, 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 and it may seem very simple, but a lot of people falter on this. So I'm going to start with a very simple example and take it to, to more and more complex examples from here. So let's understand what does falsification or destroying the conclusion mean. Okay. We're going to take the same simple example. Can you tell me under what condition would the conclusion in this argument be destroyed? Can you tell me under what condition will the conclusion be destroyed? Okay. If seats are full on IV, okay, 500 is enough for an IV leak. Some of you got this right, okay. The re and again, this is where when you think about a falsification question, you have to think about it in the context of the argument. When you say when GMAT doesn't matter for admission, is that true? Yes. Is this something which you're going to do it on the GMAT? No. You know, that, that argument would be illogical, would be nonsensical if GMAT doesn't matter. It's like the author, you're telling the author, are you stupid to even talk about the GMAT if GMAT doesn't matter? So, so yes, is it true? Yes, in, in, in the grander scheme of things, it's true. Uh, uh, is it going to happen on the GMAT? No. So, so, uh, so with this argument, what, when you think about it, and some of you have gotten this right, the falsification of conclusion means that Joe gets admission with a score of 500 in an Ivy League college. Can you guys see this? If that happens, this conclusion gets destroyed. All we've done is the author says he said he will not get admission, and very simply, we've said he gets admission. Okay. Perfect. And for those of you who say no, there's a Q and A pod out there uh, 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 the, where you can put your question in. So Navneet and Sudesh, you can put that question in the Q and A pod if you don't understand it as how is the conclusion destroyed if Joe gets admission with a score of 500. Okay. All right. Let me end this poll, remove broadcast results. So let's evaluate whether 
the assumption that we came up with is that the correct assumption okay so what we do is and this is just purely to tell you what a correct assumption looks like okay the assumption that we came up with was a score of 500 for someone like joe is unacceptable to ivy league colleges the question that we have to ask it does it satisfy that must be true condition why because we said in our definition of assumption uh, it's an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid so we ask ourselves is it must be true or in other words will joe get admission which is my conclusion breakdown condition if the statement to the left no longer holds true now here is a very important point for you to understand when i say a statement to the left no longer holds true okay what it automatically i'm also saying is that its negated version becomes true okay when i say this statement no longer holds true then what i'm by definition saying is that its negated instance becomes true which means what is the negated instance of, of this statement over here of this statement it's it is that a score of someone like a score of 500 for someone like joe becomes acceptable to ivy league colleges now if that does become acceptable then what happens to my conclusion does my conclusion get destroyed does it break down absolutely why because if a score of 500 becomes acceptable for someone like joe then i as an author cannot make a claim with 100 percent certainty that joe will not get admission into an ivy league college This is what we call as the must be true aspect of the of, 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 of my correct answer, which means you need that answer choice to be there, otherwise your conclusion will break down. This is also applying what the negation test is. We're not on pre-thinking, we're just making sure we understand what an assumption is. Now, how many of you are confused to really say, hey, how do you say that when a statement is not true, its negated version automatically becomes true? How many of you are confused with that, with that statement? So when I say a negated uh, a statement is not true, its negated version automatically becomes true. How can you say that? All right. So let's kind of take some examples. And then this is a really important concept. A lot of people, when they're learning critical reasoning, they don't learn some of the very basics of statements before they move on to arguments. Okay. And, and this is really important to understand. So the key thing which is there is if you say a statement is not true, then you are also saying that its negated version is true. Let's kind of look at some examples over here. Harvard has the best MBA program. If you say that part is not true, are you not also saying that Harvard does not have the best MBA program or an MBA program that is better or as good as Harvard exists? Are you not automatically saying that? And that is the negated version of it. So when you say a statement is not true, okay, when you say, hey, when you say Google is, 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 is the most profitable internet company and you say that statement is not true, what you're really saying is, hey, there's, a, there's a, an internet company that's as profitable or more profitable than Google that exists. By definition, you're making that claim. Okay. Similarly, and this is when you when, when let's kind of go over here. When you say John runs faster than David, and you say it's not true, by definition, what you're also saying is that David is as fast as John, or David is faster than John. Okay. In every context, that if that makes sense. So essentially, and this is really important. It's a very simple fact, but a really essential fact uh, uh, with regards to critical reasoning as well as reading comprehension okay so if an answer choice is must be true which means it's the correct assumption then the conclusion will break down the in the presence of a negated version of that answer choice why because by definition uh, 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 an unstated idea, uh, an assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. Okay. Uh, SG says, is it correct to say that Howard has a bad MBA program as a negation statement? No. Bad is not saying not the best. Okay. It's, 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 it's the polar opposite, not the logical opposite. 
Negation is a logical opposite. What you are stating is a polar opposite. Okay, it's the same way as you say something is a north pole. It's negated as not something is a south pole. It's negated as something is not a north pole. Okay, and again, don't for those of you you negate the verb form. Don't go to formulas. Yeah, some in in, in many cases you negate the verb form. It's going to be there, but think about the possible spaces that a statement can take. Okay, think about positions. Do not go with formulas, please. Especially if you want to score 90th percentile. If you want to score 60th percentile, go with formulas. Yes, that is there. But then don't expect to get into an Ivy League college. Focus on learning, not focus on learning tricks. Focus on learning, pure learning. Okay. So, and and guys, please. Put in your questions in the Q and A part because you know when you, when I, I I hate to not be able to take those questions, but we have Harsha uh, who's the head of our verbal SM team. He is here to support you during those questions. And and, and when you put your questions over here, others see them. I, I have to take them, uh, and 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 we digress a bit, and 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 then the entire webinar gets delayed. Okay, if you want to learn how to negate. We have written probably the world's uh, most comprehensive article on, on negation. Uh, you can really read that over here on our blog. Okay. Now, let's kind of come back. If an answer choice is, remember this, if an answer choice is must be true, which is it's a correct assumption, then the conclusion will break down in the presence of negated version of that answer choice. Why? Because an assumption must be true for the conclusion to hold valid, which means that in the presence of that negated version, the assumption, the conclusion will break down. That's kind of comes from, really stems from this must be true definition. That's what we call as a symbiotic relationship that, that we have. Or, or one is to one. I wouldn't call it a symbiotic, but a one is to one relationship. All right. This also works the other way around, uh, which is if an answer choice is not must be true, which means it's an incorrect answer choice, then the conclusion will not break down in the presence of that negated instance. Okay, and and let's see an example of that as well. Okay, so same argument for simplicity, and this, the answer choice that we will evaluate is that a score of five hundred on the GMAT is 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 not a good score. Okay. Um, and, and, and we're going to really see, is that a correct answer choice? So, or is that a correct assumption? So we ask ourselves, is that a must be true statement, which means, uh, will the conclusion break down, uh, or, or, or become invalid, which means will Joe get admission if the statement to the left no longer holds true? So we look at its negated version and what is the negated version that, uh, we negate this part. And we say a score of 500 on on the GMAT is is the good is a good score, and 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 and, and does Joe get admission if the score of 500 on the GMAT becomes a good score? The answer is no. Uh, uh, why? Because as per the argument, Joe's admission is not dependent on whether how you how, what you call 500 as whether it's it's, it's predicated or, or qualified as a good score, which means that hey, even if you replace 500 by 700 or 750 the logic of the argument would still stand. Okay. And as some of you are really saying, it, it's not good enough for Harvard as per the author. Yes, correct. Okay. So essentially, the key thing over here is that your must be true helps you narrow down. For the correct answer choice, what you're going to find is that the conclusion does not hold true when you negate this answer choice. For the incorrect answer choice, the conclusion still holds true when you negate this answer choice. So with that, we now conclude our, our warm-up on assumption. We're now going to go towards pre-thinking and we'll do pre-thinking exercise. Now, uh, we've had quite a few people who've joined us since um, since we started this, this webinar. And uh, uh, I want to ask this one 
a question once again this is a question that i asked when we had about 180 people in the webinar which is what kind of internet connection do you have and and and, and the three options are i have a cable internet i have a mobile dongle and and i'm or i'm using my cell phone's internet okay and, and the reason is because if you've, you've said the audio is breaking up if you're using option one your audio should stay fine throughout the webinar we use very little internet bandwidth as long as you have an internet connection that actually uh, uh, does not have a lot of latency which is what number one uh, uh, doesn't you know uh, you should be fine i mean the internet's the bandwidth that we use right is is about 80 kilobits per second at the most okay however if you have a mobile dongle or if you use your cell phone's internet then those internet connections are what we call a sporadic internet connections they have they support good burst speeds but they don't support a continuous connection for a fairly long time if you find that the audio is starting to become choppy you know log out join again when you do that your connections reset and the problem usually gets done by itself okay so what's the process that we're going to follow with this i'm going to now give you an argument we are now getting into that pre-thinking part because we have a really solid foundation in assumptions right now and again for those if you want to make it more solid go through the introduction to assumption concept file that has about 15 examples that goes way more into into that but now i think we have enough that we can go towards pre-thinking so i'm going to give you an argument it's not going to be as simple an argument that as as we did right now because i want to tell you how to go about pre-thinking then so you're going to record your pre-thinking in a short answer pod then i'm going to go towards my way of doing pre-thinking and we're going to come back to this theory and we're going to really see what what a falsification question is and then we're going to look at a few submissions over here so essentially we're going to do that three-step process with that get a pen and paper ready why because i'm going to give you your first argument All right, if you have a pen and paper ready, let's then give you your first argument. Here is your argument.
right, guys, get those answers in. I'm going to mute myself for another 30 seconds so that you guys can, can think and get those answers in. Three, two, and one. All right, guys, I am going to broadcast the results. So I want to give you about 30 seconds to, 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 to look at and read those answers over here that you see. And, 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 and this is what happens when, when, when argument becomes a bit more complex and you're asked to pre-think. Uh, you see answers which which kind of pertain which which seem to go all over the place a few of you have stated what i call as the conclusion some of you have, uh, have actually stated the logical structure others have talked about uh, stuff which seems related but 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 is not a must be true condition such as you, some people have said that tenure professors spend more time on on research and and then on teaching or or or, or or some of you have said spending time on research makes uh, is is required for someone to become a tenured faculty. Okay, uh, a few of really if you've really said uh, research does not enhance student learning, and 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 uh, and, and and so we're going to really talk about that something which is which is more or less inferable. Uh, and some of you have said, hey, there is no other reward system which is which is there. So let's kind of talk about the focus of, of this argument and then go towards it. So here's how I would. So one of the things which is really important when it comes to doing pre-thinking is being methodical over there. So you've got to be super methodical to be able to do this. Now, since you've read all of this, I'm going to clear uh, all over here. And, and I'm going to put in some yes, no poll. Um, so the first thing you've got to do in, in terms of being methodical is to isolate what the conclusion is saying then so completely isolate that use that conclusion as an independent statement not worry about anything else that the that that's presented in the argument okay the second thing you have to do is is you then focus on answering this question how does the author arrive at this conclusion what logic does the author use to arrive at the conclusion and then you ask a pre-thinking question it's a question that we would formulate and this has to be done in these three steps don't mix these steps together don't miss any one of these steps how many of you are as methodical how many of you isolate and understand the conclusion first before you worry about hey uh, uh, how does the author arrive at this? And again, one of the most important things with regards to hitting that 700 score is is being being very realistic of your or of evaluating yourself. All right, 60% of you or more, give or take, are saying that you do these steps, you isolate the conclusion, and you understand the conclusion before looking at the answer choices. So let's keep that number in 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 mind. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about what is that falsification method over here, and 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 uh, and and and, and, uh, and that falsification method comes from this one thing, which is what the definition of an assumption. What's an assumption? It's an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. And and just to be very clear, where I am, I'm going to briefly talk about what this falsification uh, a question or this pre-thinking question is. Uh, uh, and 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 then we're gonna go for you start with step one, then we're gonna go to step two, and then we're gonna come back to step three. So let's kind of understand how to formulate a falsification or a pre-thinking question. Okay, what is an assumption? An unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. What it means is that without an assumption, a conclusion will break down. This means 
that an assumption has to be built around those scenarios where the conclusion breaks down in the first place. Why? Because your assumption is that 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 essential pillar. If you if you visualize that roof structure, your assumption is that essential pillar that that prevents that that roof from caving in. Does that make sense? If assumption prevents the conclusion from breaking down, then the assumption has to be built around those scenarios where the conclusion breaks down, right? Because that's where if you were to build a house, that's where you would pull all those pillars where you say, hey, this is where the roof is likely to cave in. And if my roof is my conclusion, I'm going to put a pillar over here because this is where my roof is caving in. Okay. So to figure out where assumptions are or what assumptions are let's figure out all the scenarios in which the conclusion breaks down why because we have to put an assumption over there to prevent those scenarios from happening that's essentially the whole essence of it why and and if you think about where it comes from it comes from this very definition that an assumption must be true for the conclusion to to be valid but assumption has to be true for the conclusion to be valid. So let's figure out where, where and how the conclusion is invalidated and formulate an assumption right next to it over there. Okay. So what is your falsification or your pre-thinking question? The question is, under what circumstances, given the facts and the argument, will the conclusion break down? And this is a really important question. This is the second thing that I want you to write down. And, and and, and 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 write this down over here and because you're going to use this question again and again in this session now when you think about it you you can really see why before you formulate this question you need to understand the conclusion why because if you if you don't understand the conclusion you won't be able to figure out uh, how does the conclusion break down if you don't understand the logical structure you know you won't be able to understand this part so both of these Understanding the conclusion and understanding the logical structure is important before you start formulating that question. If you're unable to do that, your formulation will not be precise. Okay, so here is my argument, and and I have three statements over here. The first thing is let's identify the conclusion before we understand the conclusion. Okay, so let me put in my poll question over here. I have four options in this poll question. Only worry about statements one, two, and three because this argument is divided only in three statements. Tell me which statement, according to you, is the main conclusion. Three. Which statement is the main conclusion? Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll and broadcast the results. Okay, so 47% of you say statement two is the main conclusion and you guys are correct. And, and again, when you see this, more than half the class couldn't even identify what the main conclusion is. And, and 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 this is kind of where you see hey if you can't identify the main conclusion you probably can't even dream of solving an assumption or any argument based question correctly why do we say that this is the main conclusion how do you figure out which statement is the main conclusion what's the what's the litmus test okay that's an that's a marker yes clearly but what is the 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 litmus test What is the litmus test? Okay, and the conclusion has to be an opinion, but there are arguments in which you have multiple opinions. Okay, B because of A, A, B, C test, all right. Now some of you are talking about an EGMAT terminology. Who said this? Let me just look at, there was someone who, who actually said even a much more generic thing. Okay, Rajiv said made against. Why? Why does the author? What's the purpose of a of an argument? What is the purpose of an argument?
what is the purpose of an argument to draw out a conclusion yes that is true who said that kriti that is true the whole reason an argument exists is because of the conclusion the all author wants to do is to is to is to make is to prove his point so when you think about which statement is the main conclusion ask yourself what does the author want you to believe in ask this one question and 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 as you ask this one question you're going to the, the statement that gives you the answer to that question is going to be your main conclusion okay and in this case what the author wants you to believe in is is statement number 2 which is that the difference between professors in the tenure system and other full time lecturers has to do with the reward system for the former this is what the author wants you to to believe in some of you are asking we have this word concludes here in statement one why is that not the the main conclusion who has made who has concluded this who has made this conclusion in statement one the paper is it is it the author no the author presents it as a fact okay and 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 so so it's not the author's conclusion it is the paper's conclusion and which is you know this fact is really important to understand in the context of reading comprehension as well when it comes to an inference in reading comprehension the same principle applies an inference is what the author believes in okay you can't draw an inference in an rc passage based on someone else's belief okay so statement 2 is my main conclusion why because that's what the author wants you to take away from this okay what is a litmus test a litmus test is a, is, a, is is again for those of you who um, are more science oriented if you want to test an acid versus base there's something called a litmus paper and you put your 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 liquid on it and it changes color accordingly so it's it's a famous test it's a famous way to test and the litmus test means that hey if you ask a certain question uh, uh, the answer to this will give you a conclusive uh, uh, will take you to to uh, to a definitive answer i don't want to use a conclusive answer because you're talking about a conclusion so then let's visualize the conclusion over here and just let's us focus on reading this and and clearly the difference in the tenure system and other full time lecturers has to do with the reward system for the former okay so what the author is saying is okay uh, that that hey i agree with the finding so the author is 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 uh, uh, i shouldn't say the word don't here the author is saying is hey i agree with the findings and i think the reason why those findings exist is 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 because of the reward system the reason why these findings exist is because of the reward system says so Uh, uh, the reward system, which is there between full-time lectures and then the professors in the tenure system, is the cause of the finding. Okay, how many of you, when you read the argument, visualize the statement that the author is blaming that that reward system for the findings, and he's saying, "Hey, the re- the difference exists. The difference in learning exists because of the reward system." Okay, I'm going to put in a yes/no poll over here because I want more answers. Does that gives me good a statistical? How many of you visualize this? Spent some time to visualize this, and and this is kind of where you know uh, this this starts to get a bit interesting. And when you see those numbers, half of you couldn't get to the conclusion, and about thirty percent, twenty five percent of you couldn't visualize even if you got to the conclusion. All right, let's kind of go to the logical structure of this. So here is the structure of the argument. So your statement two is the main conclusion. This is what the author is trying to make you believe. Let's see why does the author do that? Okay, statement one is 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 uh, so. he does that because he says he gives you a supporting statement he's where it says the criteria for rewarding tenured faculty typically places greater emphasis on research than on teaching okay and then he also gives you some context which says hey there is this research paper that is published that has concluded that this group of professors this group of teachers who are tenured professors they enhance student learning less than 
full-time lecturers who are outside the tenure system do. Okay, so the author is saying, okay, I have this finding and the reason that this finding exists is because of this reward system. Now, I want you to tell me, and this is kind of where another piece that 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 you need to, to make sure that you, you focus on is, when you think about uh, statement three over here, whose reward system does statement three talk about? Is it tenured faculty, is it lecturer, or is it both? Whose reward system does statement three talk about? Is it tenured faculty? Is it lecturers? Is it both? Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. One thing that I'd say, guys, I have about 280 students here in the webinar. I only see 150 of you participating. If you are here in this webinar, participate. That's the best way to, to get the most out of this webinar. Okay. Uh, so 22% of you say it's both. 6.5% of you say it's, it's, it's lecturers. But 71% say it's just tenured faculty. 71% of you are correct. It is just tenured faculty. Why? Because what the statement says is the criterion for, for rewarding tenured faculty typically places greater greater is a comparative word emphasis on research than on teaching which means that it's comparing the emphasis on research and teaching just for tenured faculty and and and, and if you just read this uh, and, and i'm going to ask you a question do we know anything about the reward system for for full-time lecturers from this argument no there's nothing that we know about the reward system of full-time lecturers over here Okay, and that's really important for, 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 for you to be able to achieve that level of comprehension even before you ask. Tyler says, no, but possibly we could infer that it has more emphasis on teaching. Not really. You can't infer that. How can you infer that? Do you think the author would agree that, he, that the reward system for full-time lecturers has more emphasis on teaching? Tyler, do you think that the author would agree with that? Can you be 100% certain that, that such is the case? No. An inference is a statement for which you are 100% certain. Okay. Again, I'm going to, guys, I have about 300 students here. So, so I can't explain Every doubt, I'm going to focus on major doubts, but I'm going to give you the recording so that you can watch it again. Okay, so then we come to, so we understood the logical structure. We un First, we understood and visualized the conclusion. Then we understood the logical structure. Now we're going to ask the pre-thinking question. Under what circumstances, and the pre-thinking question is, under what circumstances, given the facts and the argument, will the conclusion break down? Remember, this is the exact wording that we had, and we're going to repeat this. Now, in the context of this argument, um, we're going to really apply this question. And, and what it leads to is, under what circumstances would the reward system not be responsible? Okay, Why do we say would the reward system not be responsible? Why? Because that's when the conclusion breaks down. For the difference in performance, given that, what we know is, that full-time lecturers enhance student performance more than professors do. And the reward system for professors places greater emphasis on research than on teaching. Again, we've just really said, hey, tell me those circumstances under which you can't blame the reward system. Why? Because in my conclusion, I was blaming the reward system. The author blames the reward system. So under what condition will the conclusion break down? Under conditions in which you can't blame the reward system. Falsification question clear? If you get an answer to this question, can you really see how the conclusion will break down with regards to answers to these questions? Okay. Okay. So, same question. Under what, under what condition will the reward system not cause a difference between tenured and, and non-tenured given that we know that reward system for tenured places 
greater emphasis. Again, what we are really saying is under what condition can you not blame the reward system? Okay, one of them is if if the non-tenured faculty has similar emphasis on research. Okay, which means their reward system is identical. Then you can't blame the reward system. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yeah, if it's identical, then you can't blame the reward system over here. And, and, and it's very, very simple. The second thing is, what if the tenured faculty, so this, this one is for non-tenured faculty. What if this, these lecturers, these, te, uh, these sorry, uh, professors, or, or what, who we call as these tenured faculty, if they don't care about the reward system? If, if tenured professors don't act as per the reward system, then can you blame the reward system? Well, you can't blame the reward system anymore, right? If they don't act as per, 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 per the reward system, then you can't blame the reward system as the one that's responsible for the inferior outcomes, teaching outcomes. Okay. In either of these cases, my conclusion breaks down. So if these are the cases in which my conclusion breaks down, my assumptions are, hey, my non-tenured faculty does not have uh, uh, an identical reward system. And then most tenured professors, they, they care about my reward system. Okay. Now, look at, think about the three steps we, that we went through. We visualize the conclusion. We created the logical structure, and 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 and, and then we arrived at this. Okay. So. Can you really see how asking this question methodically helps us come up with these falsification scenarios? How, if you go about doing this methodically, you can really see that? And I see some of you are coming up with a few other scenarios, some of which are correct, some of which are wrong. And again, I want you to not do that for, for, for one second. I want you to focus on the process. Because it's not about just this question. It's about understanding the process so we can solve other questions. Okay. Um, some of you are coming up with some really great scenarios, which are really good, incorrect answer choices. Uh, I am not going to go over there right now. Maybe I'll do another webinar. Why? Because to, to justify those incorrect answer choices, I will go to a level where half of the class over here is not that uh, half of the class over here is not equipped to deal with. So, so if you're an EG math student and if you have those doubts, send those over to me and, 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 and we'll promise to, uh, uh, to give you a video response because some of you are coming up with some really great questions which I would love to answer but if I go on towards answering those questions I it would it would defeat the purpose of this webinar 60 70 percent of you would not uh, would not get it so you're saying what are the two assumptions there are multiple assumptions there are about three more assumptions that I can come up with but but the two over here are these ones that non-tenured faculty do not have or those lecturers who, who, who improve student learning, they don't have an identical reward system. And then the tenured fact professors, most of them care about the reward system. Okay. Now, this was a pre-thinking question and I'm going to quickly go through this over here. And you have this. Now, for those of you who are asking for the negation article, you can go over here. I'm going to talk about Timing. How many of you are concerned about timing when you see this and say, man, this seems to take a lot of time? Okay. A bit. Okay. It's, it's, it's a concern and it's a legitimate concern when you see and say, man, I never saw. How many of you have seen this many steps while answering a question? 
uh, and I'll be happy to put the link in Q&A. Uh, how many of you have seen these many steps answering a question? Not me. How many of you have seen a CR expert go through this much detail? Never. Okay. Uh, other than an EGMAT expert. Why do you think they don't? Why do you think they don't go through this much detail? Yes, why do you think they use quick tips? You're right, they use quick tips. Why do you think? Ask yourself, what would happen if I told you I have these three tricks I have these three tricks which only I have and if I if I were to tell you those three tricks uh, it'll if you are able to apply those three tricks you would be able to get to a score of 720 and 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 let me ask say this if I were to tell you What would happen if I were to tell you these three tricks? What would happen to your propensity to buy? You'll fall for this, right? You would buy right away. Say, man, this seems so easy. I'm going to just get those three tricks, and 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 I'm going to be able to get to this because all of you, no one wants to be. How many of you want to be in this webinar? Let me ask this question. How many of you want to be here? Yes, no, and 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 and. No, I'm not saying how many of you are enjoying this webinar, but how many of you would rather do something else than be in this webinar on a Saturday morning or a Saturday night? Because I'll tell you, I would rather do something else. I would rather spend this morning. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I would rather spend this morning with my with my kids, right? And and not be in this webinar. But the reason why you are here is because you need to ace the GMAT. And 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 if something makes it really quick for you to ace the GMAT, you would do it. Okay. So, and that's kind of why, what a lot of people see and say, man, if I tell them it's so quick to, to, to get to that 730, 740 score, I'm going to sell my course and then that's there is. No, that doesn't work that way. If you want enduring results, you need to learn. Tricks will do not work on the GMAT. So, so here is how this is going to work. All right. Let's assume you start with point number one, and, and this is a chart over here where your accuracy is low and your time to answer questions is medium. Okay. Now, when you start applying pre thinking, two things will happen. First, your accuracy will go up. The second thing that's going to happen is your time to answer questions will go up as well. And why do we say that? You can see your chart is moving in this direction. You know, on, on the x-axis, we are moving from medium towards high. On the y-axis, we are moving towards low towards medium, from low to medium accuracy. And you're going to ask yourself, why the hell am I doing this? Okay, it's, I'm already worried about timing on the GMAT. And, um, and, 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 you know, this seems to be making me take longer. And it will make you take longer. I will tell you as you start doing this. At that point, keep on trusting the process and as you keep as you trust the process as you diligently do the process as you don't quickly go through the process and again that's very important i don't want you to to time yourself while you're going through the process i don't want you to 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 to, to really not visualize the conclusion uh, what you're going to find is two things will happen your accuracy will continue to go up your time to answer questions will go down it will go down beyond that point number one as you can see and that point you're going to really say hey now i understand why is it that 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 we do pre-thinking to asg math cr 
and 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 that would be what we call as as as, as a state of positive feedback once you get there you'll get that aha moment yes you'd continue doing that you would reach point number 4 okay What's the average time that you should spend on a question in GMAT? It just depends. If it's a boldface question, two and a half minutes. If an assumption question of medium difficulty, a minute 45. Assumption question of hard difficulty, about two minutes. A very hard assumption question, two, and, two minutes and 15 seconds. That's what you should. It doesn't mean that everyone spends that time. There are certain people who are just great with sentence correction and they use that additional time. On, 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 on critical reasoning. Others actually are great with critical reasoning and they can do CR in a minute 30 and they use that additional time in sentence correction. So there is no one answer for this. But but and and, and how many of you think GMAT's a test of time? Okay. Yes, partially no. I will tell you that that on the GMAT, the beauty of, of GMAT, or, or for that matter, any computer adaptive test is you solve 75% of the question questions, you, st you can get to 98th percentile ability. You can get to 750 or, or 740, I won't say 750, but a 740 score, which I think is good enough for most of you if you solve 75% of the questions correctly. So it's a test of ability. On the other hand, most people, is 740 is 97th percentile who's who 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 actually finish the test on time don't get to a 740 why because it's they don't have the ability and and and, and that's really important for you to understand on the gmat timing is probably 20 percent of the battle ability is 80 percent and a lot of people focus purely on timing And, and 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 that's something which which I want you to to make sure that you do. You don't focus on timing. You focus purely on on building ability. As you focus on building ability, you'll find that you won't have to worry about timing at all. Okay. So, and and I'm going to share. Someone was saying, how many, what percentage of of or how many people get to that that level for? If everyone who tries gets to level four, and which is where if you go to share GMAT experience, click on on on, on the eGMAT uh, tag over there. You're going to find ten plus pages of success stories, more than ten pages. Each page has about fifty success stories over there. If you go to the review section, you're going to find we are just shy of nineteen hundred reviews, whereas no other prep company has even more than a thousand reviews. And trust me, we are not the oldest partner on GMAT Club. So, so there are partners who are way older than us, you know, Magush, Manhattan GMAT, uh, Veritas Prep, they're way older than, or, or they were before eGMAT's time. Despite that, we have more than twice as many reviews as each one of these companies. Okay. Here's a statement over here. It says, um, from a guy who scored 740, it says, understand the passage completely. Take your time. Equally important, pre-think. An answer before looking at an answer choice. Probably this one word will have most impact on your GMAT score. Here's a guy who skipped one RC passage and scored 740, by the way, just to, to kind of validate what I was talking about. Uh, there's another guy who said, answer CR questions as if there are no answer choices. Pre-thinking is a game changer. Now, this guy scored 700 in his first attempt. Uh, he had a 30th percentile ability in, 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 in CR. He came to us and said, help me with CR. In 20 days, with pre-thinking, we turned that 30th percentile ability to 97th percentile ability. He says, when it gets to 700 plus questions, you have to do pre-thinking. The reason to do pre-thinking is to help you focus on the logic and not deviate from the key argument when trap or auto score answer choices show up. He scored a 770. You can actually... Uh, watch his interview. You can you can read his success story. You can download his ESRs. Okay, and then there's another guy who said, "Hey, this pre-thinking primes the mind, and we are constantly on our toes while reading an RC paragraph. So pre-thinking is really important in RC as well, or a CR question stem. 
apart from comprehending the passage, we keep speculating that in which direction the passage will orient or what logical jumps or logical jump has the author taken. So there's a guy who improved from 540 in mocks to 740 on the actual test. So about 220 point jump. Now let's go to third example over here. So everything that we're doing over here, barring the first example is going to be difficult. We're going to really see how pre-thinking makes difficult questions simple. Okay. So here is our third example. I'm going to give you uh, 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 this question. Please focus on pre-thinking because this question may seem simple, but if you do not focus on pre-thinking, the answer choices will kill you. Okay. Guys, last 30 seconds, get those answers in. Okay, five, four, three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. And I'm gonna broadcast the results. And and what we see over here is is you know you have choices B and E that are very popular. Uh, and, and choice C is reasonably popular as well. Uh, so we're going to focus on this. So I'm going to let's put in another quest poll over here. And give me the poll is how is this question and 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 the answer choices are.
easy, medium, tricky, I could not understand it. So they are easy as if it was very easy for you, medium as if you felt, hey, it was medium difficulty, tricky was if you were confused, and I could not understand that it was like, hey, I didn't know how to go about doing that. Okay, and then while you're doing this, I'm gonna put in a yes, no poll over here. Let's get some more answers. How many of you did pre-thinking here? How many of you did pre-thinking? Okay. 90% of you did pre-thinking, that's good. That is really nice. Then I'm gonna put in my short answer poll question over here. And again, we at EGMAT are suckers for data, so you add information. So you tell me what was the pre-thinking question you asked. Put in your pre-thinking question over here. Put in your pre-thinking question. Okay. Okay, guys, spend some time to put in your pre thinking question if you need to get feedback on where you faltered. Why? Because 60 plus percent of you have faltered in this question while answering this question. And, and what I can really see is, is that, you know, a good chunk of you consider this question to be easy or medium despite faltering. What was the pre-thinking question that you asked? And I only see one good terminology. Under what circumstances would the annual revenue generated by the toll highway not increase by 50%? That is the correct pre-thinking question. We talked about the format. I gave you the format. I talked about this as about process. And yet the questions that I see over here, do not adhere to the process. A good chunk of them. And let's kind of see where you faltered. And this is for you to see where you faltered over here. So what's the conclusion? Statement two is the conclusion. It's very, very clear or, or forms a conclusion where the commissioner claims that the toll increase will increase the annual revenue by at least 50 percent okay so what's the uh, conclusion annual revenue generated by toll highway will go up by at least 50 percent so let's kind of look at and put some numbers over here it always helps me to do that so if last year the revenue was one million dollars so uh dollar one million then this year that would go to dollar 1.5 million plus so it will go by at least 50%, all right? That's kind of where it is. If, if last year it was 10 million, it will go to at least 15 million plus, okay? Sai so says there's no author's view in this statement. How can we come to the conclusion? So I read the question statement. Which of the following, the author is asking you, which of the following is an assumption on which highway commissioner's claim depends? The, the author is asking you this question. Okay, so so that's how you really come to it. All right, so here is your statement over here. Now tell me, how do we estimate annual revenue? In this given scenario, how would you estimate annual revenue? All right, perfect. Distance into toll per mile. All right, how do we estimate annual revenue? Toll per mile multiplied by the total number of toll miles. So, so when you say distance, you have to express it in the total number of toll miles, okay? Is everyone clear on this? This is how you estimate annual revenue. Ye ne? Yes, everyone's clear on this. That's great, or most of you are. Okay. Again, let's then go to the pre-thinking question where you have this over here. 
And the generic form of pre-thinking question is, under what circumstances, given the facts and the argument, will the conclusion break down? Which means, under what circumstances would the annual revenue not increase by 50%, provided that toll per mile is has been increased by 50%. Any doubts on the pre-thinking question? This is my pre-thinking question over here. Any doubts on it? Okay, if you have a doubt, put it in over there in the in the Q&A pod. If you don't have a doubt, which I think 97% of you do not have a doubt, let's move forward. So under what circumstances uh, 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 would that happen? What is the falsifying scenario? We already know that toll per mile has gone up by 50%, right? This is something that's given as a fact to us. Toll per mile has increased by 50%. So the only possible scenario is if the total number of miles decreases. If that number decreases, then uh, 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 my, my conclusion will break down. So what is my assumption? The total number of miles does not decrease. Why? Because my, my falsifying scenario is the total number of miles decreases. And my assumption is the total number of miles driven on those toll highways, that number does not decrease. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. For those of you who are saying no, let me just actually bring in the poll again because we have some no from the prior poll. Is that clear to everyone? Can I please publish the passage again? Yes. Again, that's a classical indication of not doing pre-thinking properly. Let me publish the passage again. Uh, hold on. Just give me one second, guys. Here is the passage again, for those of you who want to see it. Okay. Now, how do I got? How did I get this formula? Simply from the information given in the argument. Your toll is ten cents per mile, and you're considering a fifty percent increase. So the revenue has to be toll per mile into total number of toll miles. Okay. So, with that, let's look at how you polled on this. Answer choice B. Thirty-two percent of you thought that was correct. Why did you think answer choice B is correct? Let's look at answer choice B over here. Answer choice B says the total number of trips made on the toll highway will not decrease from its current level. We asked this question. Remember we did that. Is that must be true? If the total number of trips decreases, does it mean that the total number of miles traveled on toll roads will decrease? Does it mean that? A yes, no? No, it doesn't mean that. Okay. The answer to this is no. Why? Because the total number of miles traveled might still remain the same if the number of miles per trip increases. Okay. For those of you who chose choice C, choice B is the correct answer. Can you really see why this is not a must be true? Can you see that? It is not required to be true. It's a good to be true thing. It's a great strengthener. It's not an assumption. And which is where, which is why I focused early on on the must be true aspect of the assumption. An assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to hold, to hold valid. Is it required to be true that the total number of trips made on toll highway per year not decrease? No, it's not required to be true. 
which is why this is not the correct answer. Harsha is saying, Harsh Vardhan is saying, please show the options again. Harsha, we will show the options. Wait. One of the things that I will also tell you is you do, that that you know what contrary to what other people say, you have to choose the best of the given options. That is something that you don't have to do. In a GMAT CR question, the correct answer, you'll have only one correct answer and it will be 100 percent correct. Okay. Uh, even if choice E weren't there, choice B would not have been correct. Okay. Let's look at choice E. Choice E talks about the total distance traveled, okay, uh, uh, and it says the total distance will not go down again. Does it mean that the total number of uh, 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 miles traveled on this will decrease? Absolutely, yes. Why? Because if the total distance decreases, then the total number of miles also decreases. Uh, and, and, and hence, this is a must be true. Choice E is the correct answer over here. And for those of you who want to really see, choice E over here is the correct answer, this one. If the total number of trips decreases, then the, also the annual revenue will go down. Why? Why would it go down? Why will the annual revenue go down if the total number of trips decreases? Yes. Well, no, trips are not shorter. Total number decreases. Okay, let's look at choice D over here. Okay, let's look at this. And, and this is where you need to understand. This is where the understanding of what an assumption is, is, is really important. Okay. So, let's look at choice D. And, and, and this is where you can do this fairly easily. Choice D says a number of drivers will not go increase from its current level. Let's take the current scenario. And by the way, for those of you who are EGMAT students, we have a, an entire video file with about 15 examples and exercise questions on, on just quant based questions. So today, let's say 1000 drivers avoid with and 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 uh, let's say today 1000 drivers avoid toll 1000 use toll tomorrow let's say 900 avoid uh, 1100 avoid toll And which means 900 use toll. Does it mean that the total number of miles driven will go down? Does it mean that? No. Why? It doesn't know. It doesn't mean that. What if? It doesn't mean that. Let's let me tell you why. Okay, it's not necessary. It's for those of you who chose choice D or choice C, please read the statement which I'm going to color in blue.
if you chose choice D or C, can you see this? Yes. The total annual revenue is told per mile into distance into number of cars. So it's what is distance in your equation over here? SD. What is distance? It's distance per car, right? In your formula, it's it's miles per trip or distance per car, either way you want to do it. If if the number of cars goes down, the distance per car can go up. This was a 700 level question. The stats show that. This is an official question, by the way. And this is where that precise understanding of must be true is really important. And for those of you who are thinking about secondary tertiary trips, you're overthinking this. This is as simple as that. If you do pre-thinking, pre-thinking tells you it's about total distance or total number of highway miles. You focus on and you say, hey, which answer choice talks about total number of highway miles? Okay. Beyond that, you're getting confused. Any doubt on any of the other answer choices? Any doubt over here? Why is C not correct? Okay, C talks about the average length of the trip. It's just the opposite. If the average length of the trip decreases, then can't the total number of trips increase to make up for it? Okay, and which is where? What is an assumption? Can you write down the definition of an assumption that I ask you to make note of? What is an assumption? Unstated idea must be true. Is this must be true over here? Is this must be true over here? Is this must be true? Ask yourself. Is this must be true? And the answer to this, each one of these would be no, it's not must be true because it can be, it can be compensated with something else. The only thing that is must be true is, is what's mentioned in choice E. This total distance this must be true. It all stems from this. Charan says, I, I, I feel this question is very easy compared to the former one because it has the math question, but I followed the pre-thinking approach. So Charan, here is something which you have to understand. Okay, What you think is easy is not what is easy as per the GMAT. The GMAT considers the question easy, medium, or difficult based on how statistically a group performs. And statistically, only 41% of the people got this right, which means all, almost 59% of the people got this wrong, which makes it a difficult question. Any question where the accuracy is less than 50% is a difficult question. Okay, with that, we're going to go to our last two question marathon. We're going to apply what we learned over here and, 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 and do things. Okay, so, so, Buckle your seat belts. We're going to solve two very difficult questions. But if you apply pre thinking, you're going to find they're very easy. Now, we're going to follow a method where we call as, as, as the group, uh, as timing by group. So I'm not going to time you guys. I'm going to give you this, ask you to select not answered over here so that I want at least 90 people to say not answered. And for tomorrow's quant webinar, we will use this again and again because tomorrow we'll solve 15 questions. In, in the webinar itself. So I want 90 people to say not answered and when these 90 choose an answer choice other than not answered, I know that you guys are done with with, with solving the question and that's when I would call time. So you guys as, as a group will time yourself. I will not time you. All right, I have 65 people, guys. You guys are delaying this. I need 90 people to say not answered. Come on. 
I have 200 people here. Let's get 90 people to say not answered. Good. 92. See, it wasn't that difficult. Here is your question. Good luck. All right, about 80% of the class is done. Get those answers in last 10 seconds, guys. Five, four, three, 
two and one. Let me end the poll. I'm going to broadcast the results. Here's how you guys polled. Each of the answer choices from A to B is, is, is pretty heavily liked. There's no consensus amongst uh, how you guys, uh, uh, which answer choice is correct. Um, now we're going to solve another question and then we're going to discuss both these questions. Let's get this one over here. Select not answered. 190 people to say not answered and then I'm going to show the next question. Ninety people, guys. Okay, three, two, and one. Let me remove broadcast results. Here is your next question. You should now be able to see the next question, and I'm going to mute myself.
All right, guys, 80% of you are done. Get those answers in. Five, four, three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. Broadcast the results. Both of these questions, 700 level questions, and this choice D is really popular. Choice C is quite popular as well as is choice A, as well as choice E. And, and you can really see these are difficult questions. There. Both of them are official questions, by the way. Uh, but uh, if you're an EGMAT student, go to Scholaranium, go to our post assessment files. You'll see similar EGMAT questions as well over here. So let's discuss these questions. And, and 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 I'm gonna ask just one question over here before I go uh, where is my yes no poll yes how many of you visualize the conclusion de uh, as, as a separate step in this how many of you visualize the conclusion and again I got I have 140 students who participated in these polls so I need at least a hundred responses the question is how many of you visualized the conclusion okay I need a hundred responses I have 90 responses you struggle to visualize okay tried I don't think I did successfully all right so 80% of you visualize the conclusion. Now let's kind of look at, and, and this is where, you know, uh, where you try and do something and you falter. Let me just show you how you polled. In this question, choice D was the most popular choice. Now tell me one thing. I want you to read the conclusion once again here. What kind of programming is the conclusion about? What kind of programming is the conclusion about? RDS. What kind of programming again? RDS or special, right? That's the same, special or RDS. Now, what kind of programming does choice D talk about? What kind of programming does choice D, D for Delta, talk about? Read choice D again. Okay, what kind of radios does choice D talk about? What kind of radios? Is it RDS radio? Or non-RDS radio? It's non-RDS. One landers who did not own radios equipped to receive RDS without RDS. Okay, radios that don't contain RDS programming, uh, don't contain that people who don't have RDS radios, can they really receive RDS programming? No. Can choice D even remotely be correct if you just understood the conclusion? If you understood the conclusion properly and, and, and had you read choice D, could it, would you, you should have just rejected it because it doesn't talk about the right kind of programming. It doesn't talk about the right kind of radios. It has nothing to do with what goes on in the conclusion. Think about it. The conclusion says receiving number of landers receiving special program information did not increase significantly. Choice G talks about people who can't get RDS programming. Okay, it's not relevant. But we'll discuss this in detail. I'm not going to go towards tricks. But what I, the reason what I want to talk about is the when I say you've got to visualize the conclusion, the extent of understanding that you are getting to and moving forward, and the extent of understanding that you need to get to to be able to be successful is very different okay so let's visualize the conclusion 
what the con what the conclusion is saying over here and we're going to explain this i'm just trying to tell you what's the level of precision that i want you to get to you i'm going to explain this question so so if you did not get to it in about 8 minutes you will get to it so so but let's just focus on just the conclusion so what this conclusion is saying is uh, 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 if in 1994 i had a thousand people who could receive special programming now in 1996 so this is 1994 and you can you can see it's an old official question why because you're talking about radios here not cell phones but you could probably make us uh, uh, another question that's uh, the same question with the context of cell phones in 1996 six you also will have about a thousand people with, with that can receive special programming is that clear is that clear with regards to the conclusion yeah nay let's just move this okay just just look at this again all right now let's just kind of stay over here does this thousand depend on whether there are one million people in Verland or whether there are 10k people does the conclusion depend on the number of people in Berlin? No, it doesn't. You could have a, a million people there. You could have, uh, 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 you know, 10,000 people there. It doesn't matter. Okay. So that's the level of understanding. Let's move forward. Okay. Let's do the argument structure right now. Okay. Uh, the conclusion says the number of Verlanders receiving SPL, special SPI, special program information, did not go up a whole lot between these two years. Um, let's kind of look at this. So this is your main conclusion. Now, why does the author say that? There are two reasons why the author arrives at this conclusion. One is the number of RDS equipped radios uh, did not change between 96 and 94. Okay. And the second is the number of transmitting towers increased tremendously. Now, you see this word, however, between these two, what means is that statement two and statement three go against each other. So which, and because statement three is a supporting statement to the main conclusion, so which means statement two seems to go against the main conclusion and which, because they're linked by however. So and if you also think about it from the content of this, you can really say, hey, if you have more transmitting towers, more people should be reached, but the, the, the conclusion saying that's not the case. And statement one says, radio stations with RDS technology broadcast special program that only radios with an RDS feature can receive. So what does statement one say? It says, hey, if you if you need to receive special programming, you need two things. One is you need an RDS radio and then you need an RDS transmitting stations. Are you guys clear with every aspect of it? Yes, no poll. All right, it seems pretty much everyone's clear. Let's move forward. So let's do the logical structure. The conclusion is very few additional world landers received RDS program. Between 94 and 96, the number of RDS radios remained almost unchanged, which means if there were a thousand radios in 94, there were a thousand in 96. And the number of transmitting stations, we already know they increased quite a bit. They went from 250 to 600. The context is, to receive special programming, you need RDS radio. You also need an RDS transmitting station. Based on this, the author arrives at the conclusion. All right. With that, let's go to the same thing. Ask this question. Under what condition will there be a significant addition to the number of people receiving RDS programming, given that we have very few additional radios and with a lot more transmitting stations? So I want you to tell me the falsification question conditions over here. What are the falsification conditions? Can you guys type them out? Under what conditions will there be more people receiving the special programming given that the number of radios remain the same and given that you have a lot more transmitting stations? 
okay okay you got the first condition where if a lot of people start sharing radios if we start putting these radios in starbucks taking them from homes and increases putting them in starbucks what is the other piece if the new radio stations open more new areas yes vivek says right oh, no who said that uh, more new uh, yeah bharat says bharat is correct if, if these new radio stations uh, uh, open new areas the possible scenarios are if the radio stations now cover areas where people had the right kind of radio they had radios but there was no coverage earlier okay or the second condition is that if far more people are listening to every radio people per radio increases in both of these cases uh, that's going to be the thing you guys can see how either one of these conditions can break down my conclusion yes no either one of these happens it, it can break down my break my conclusion down all right and you guys came up with, with both of them so so it so it's people who are doing this for the first time can come up with these as well if you understand the argument so what are my assumptions new stations don't increase the coverage okay and the second is people per radio remain about the same Jess says, if, 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 uh, Harsha, you can actually take on Jess's doubt. So, with that, let's now look at the answer choices. And I want you to tell me where you faltered. So, I'm going to put in the poll over here and I'm going to tell you which answer choice is correct. Choice A, A for alpha, is the correct choice. So let's see why choice A is correct and why every other answer choice is, is completely incorrect. Choice A says, few if any of the RDS radio stations that began broadcasting after 94 broadcast to people with the RDS equipped radios living in areas not previously reached. Okay, very complex choice. So let's simplify this. Okay, few if any means almost none. Of the RDS radio station that began broadcasting after 94. Which are the RDS radio stations that began, began broadcasting after 94? These are my new stations. Are you guys with me? Yes, no poll. Are you guys with me? So far? All right. Broadcast to people with RDS equipped radios living in areas not previously reached. So if these new stations broadcast to people who are living in areas where the older stations did not reach, what are these new radio stations doing? They are increasing the coverage of, of RDS programming. So what this choice is saying is almost none of the ra new radio stations increase the coverage of RDS programming. Okay. Which is the assumption uh, that we came up with. Okay. Let's kind of negate this. If we negate this, the negated part, I'm going to negate almost none. And, and the answer to that would be at least some of the radio stations increase coverage, which means they reach people who previously had the right kind of radio, but clearly there was no transmitting tower which, which transmitted the special programming. So if at least some of these new radio stations increase coverage, then what happens to my conclusion? My conclusion breaks apart which means choice A passes my negation test and is the correct answer. Now, can you see how choice A is in line with our pre-thinking? I'm going to discuss every other answer choice, so don't worry about that. But let's just focus on choice A here. All right. You have the same, yeah, and, and that's where understanding the option becomes really important too. Remember, I said you've got to read the core skills. One of the three ones was you've got to understand, read and understand each option independently. Okay. Um, choice B says, in 1996, most were landers who lived within the listening area of an RDS station, already had an RDS radio. Now, 
What does the word most mean? Because 20% of you chose this. What does the word most mean over here? What does the worst word most mean? Most means more than 50%. Okay. Most means more than 50%. It's not close to 100% and, and uh, more than 50%. So now uh, let me ask this question. Is it required for the conclusion to be true that, that most world landers have the right kind of radio? Is that mandated for the conclusion to be true? Remember early on when I said, even if you have a million people living there, as long as in 94 you have a thousand and in 96 you have a thousand, it doesn't, doesn't matter. As long as a thousand remains the same. No, it's not required. What this choice says is if you live within a covered area, you probably had an RDS equipped radio. And, and the, the thing is, it's not required. Why? Because the conclusion is not about the total number of listeners in 94 and 96 it's about the change in number of listeners okay so this does not satisfy my must be true test this is a great strengthener not an assumption and for those of you who don't understand what is why it's a, it's a strengthener as you go through the strengthen module you will understand that okay let's talk about choice c choice c talks about and 15% and of you chose choice C. Choice C says, equipping a radio station with RDS technology does not decrease the station's listening area. When it comes to special programming, if a radio station... So first of all, what is my conclusion about? Let me ask this question. What's my conclusion about? What kind of programming is my conclusion about? Can you guys? It is about RDS programming, right? What so then my next question? What is the range? of RDS programming for a station that does not have RDS technology. If I have a radio station that doesn't have RDS technology, what's what kind of RDS programming can it send? Or it can can it send any RDS programming if it doesn't have RDS technology? No, so its range is zero, right? Its range is zero. Do you guys agree? For when it comes to special programming, that range is zero. Okay, so when you see this answer choice which says equipping a radio station with RDS technology does not decrease the station's listening area, what kind of programming is this talking about when it talks about station's listening area? What kind of programming is this part talking about? Is it special programming or is it non-special programming? Is it special or non-special? It is non-special, guys. It is non-special. Why? Because without RDS technology for special programming, the range is zero. Can you go below zero range? Can you go below zero range? If a radio station did not have RDS technology, was it even broadcasting special programming? Or what kind of programming was it broadcasting? It was broadcasting only non-special programming, right? So what when it talks about this, this choice talks about decreasing a station's listening area. It's not talking about RDS range. It's talking about the non-RDS range. Do we care about the non-RDS range? We don't. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't even relate to the conclusion. But for those of you, remember, you have, you have 22 people who've chosen this answer choice. All right, you have 22 people who've chosen this answer choice. So I have to explain to these 22 people that this, uh, this talks about a different kind of programming. And if you've chosen this, you've got to really ask yourself, why did you not 
ask this question. What kind of programming is this answer choice talking about? This has nothing to do with the conclusion. You are absolutely right. Okay. Choice D says, in 1996, were landers who did not own radios equipped to re receive RDS. Do we care about people who don't have RDS radios? Do we care about them? In this argument, do we care about people who don't, uh, who who cannot receive, who don't have RDS? Do we care? Ye ne. Could not receive any programming. Do we care about any programming? No, we don't care about any programming. And okay, so it discusses people who did not have RDS radios. And and, and 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 it discusses people whether who could receive any programming, whether it's RDS or non-RDS. Okay. So why is it wrong? We don't care about people who don't have RDS radios. We don't care about any programming. Okay. Let's do the negation. Let's do the negation of this. I'm gonna type in the negation of this. In 1996. 96. Just one second. This is my negation, negated statement. Okay, this is my negated statement over here. Now, what does the statement do? If they could receive some programming, can that programming, can this programming be special programming? No. The answer to that is no. If this can't be special programming, then does it impact my conclusion? Absolutely not. Okay. What did you learn so far from, from how you made those answer choices? What did you learn so far? Okay, pre-thinking is key. What else is key? Okay, negation is important. Falsify the conclusion the correct way. I need to decipher the answer choices. You have to break the sentence down. Will tricks work here, guys? Will tricks work here? Without a proper understanding, would you have been able to solve this question? No. You need that ability to visualize. You need that vision to be f to form in your brain. And that's what you need to practice. That's what you need to build. That's that's what we call as building your ability. Not worrying about, hey, this answer choice is something extreme, so I'm going to reject it. No. The GMAT is not a test of pattern recognition. It is a test of ability. I'm not going to worry about choice E. Let's go to this next question, and, and Shelby will refuse. Let's see how you guys pulled. But I'm going to... Here shall we will refuse. Here is how you guys pulled. Oops. Uh, it was choice D was about 40%, which is the correct answer. Somehow I, I, I messed it up, but choice D was 40%. Let's kind of look at this over here. What's my conclusion? What, what are we trying to achieve in this question?
reduce ash okay one of the other things which was for the previous question i used to say that i picked the right answer but i i, I picked choice c if you focus on understanding the most challenging questions will look at will will seem very easy okay what's my conclusion here i have to reduce that ash reduce residual ash by 50 percent okay and how am i going to do that i'm going to do that by reducing the truck loads this is an example of a passage which more than half of you got wrong but 80 percent of you should have gotten right because it's so simple if you focus on understanding so last year what happened we collected a lot of refuse we did not recycle anything we actually burnt everything so if you assume one trash can as one truck how many how many trucks did we burn last year if you assume one trash can as one truck how many trucks did we burn last year we burned 10 trucks yes now this year if we if we actually have and this is visualization by the way we are visualizing the conclusion i'm going to that next step if we collect the same amount of refuse how many trucks do you think we'll send for burning how many five right we'll send five trucks for burning now here is my big question to you let's see how much you understand the argument if i collect 10 times as much refuse as as what i collected last year if i collect 10 times as much refuse how many trucks do you think i'll send for burning this year if i collect 10 times as much refuse If I collect 10 times as much refuse, how many trucks do you think I'll send for burning this year? Okay, guys, I need more responses. I have only 50 responses. Three, two, come on, guys. I have 150 responses for the poll for, for this question. My question is if I collect... 10 times as much garbage how many how many trucks do you think i'm going to send for burning is it going to be five is it going to be 10 is it 25 is it 50 is it 100 three two and one let me end the poll i'm going to broadcast the results um 61 percent of you think it's 50 61 percent of you would be wrong the correct answer is just five trucks despite collecting 10 times the garbage and let's see why that is the case this year city services will separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce the number of truck loads to be incinerated to half of last year's number so what is this statement saying it's saying hey regardless of how much garbage i collect i'm going to only send as many trucks as i sent last year for incineration so if i sent 10 trucks last year uh, even if i collect 10 times as much garbage i'm going to do half of what it was last year which means just five trucks read that statement can you understand that this year city services will separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce the number of truck loads to half of last year's number it's not very tricky it requires focus it requires understanding it requires not rushing through because trust me it's not just as cr get difficult you need to do this as rc gets difficult you need to build this ability too which means if you want to get to that 740 learn to build this ability rather than focus on timing learn to build this ability okay now let's kind of look at this question over here what's the main conclusion is based on the statement which is i've got to reduce the ash to half of last year's number what's the supporting statement uh, the number of truck loads will be incinerated to last of uh, to half of last year's number that's a supporting statement this is the context and the outcome of this activity so my falsification question or, or my logical structure first uh, 
What's my conclusion? The ads generated this year will be half of what it was generated last year. Why or how? We'll send only half as many trucks and we'll recycle everything else. Last year, everything was burned and burning generated a lot of ash. So, what's my falsification question? It's the same structure. Under what conditions? Remember, you see this consistency across. Will the ash generated be greater than 50%? Why? Because we are trying to falsify the conclusion. Even if we only send half as many trucks uh, for incineration. Now, remember this. Had you focused on forming the falsification question, you would have said this. Had you said this, you would have understood that last statement. So it is all, when you follow the process, you do not miss this. What are the possible scenarios? The only way that you're going to generate more ashes if the average ash generated per truck load is higher than what was generated last year. That's the only possible scenario. So if this is your possible falsification condition, then your assumption is that ash per truck load is going to be similar to or lower than what it was last year. Isn't that a familiar pattern, guys? Where we ask the falsification question, we figure out the scenario, and we get to the assumption. And it's, it's all from the argument, right? If you can visualize that argument in your mind, this is a very natural activity. This is not rocket science. Or was this difficult once you focus on visualization? Is this more difficult than the work that you do in, uh, in your workplace? I hope not. I hope not because then you should not be doing an MBA, by the way. It's about building the right skills. Okay. Let's look at answer choices. Choice D is the correct answer. Let's look at answer choice A. Choice A says, this year, no materials that city services could separate for recycling will be incinerated. This is one of the few questions in which you have an inference which comes in the answer choices and an assumption question. Okay, why is this wrong? Because it doesn't provide any new information. This can be inferred from the argument. Okay, where the author says, whatever is separated is not sent for incineration. You can infer that from the argument. Um, choice B talks about the cost. We don't care about cost. So choices A and B, not many people chose. Let's go to choice C. Proportion of recyclable material doesn't matter. Uh, okay, why? Because, again, you know, we'll only send half as many truckloads as were sent last year for incineration. That's something which is given to us. Okay, choice D, which is the correct answer, talks about ash per truckload, which is what we came up with our pre-thinking. All right, and it compares ash per truckload that was generated last year versus this year, which means what it's saying is we're not going to pack our trucks so densely that it generates a ton more ash, and which is in line with our pre-thinking. You can see the negated statement did more ash per truckload impact on conclusion, it will break down, which means it passes the negation test. Choice E talks about the total quantity of refuse will be no greater. Doesn't matter to us. Why? Because we are only going to send half as many truckloads for incineration. Okay. So, negated statement, the total quantity would be greater or similar to or, or, or greater the impact on conclusion no impact. Okay. So, what do we? What have we learned? And how can we? What can we do over here? From here on. What have we learned? Let's put in those those learnings over here. And you can download the PDF, by the way. What have we learned? Don't need more practice. You need to really focus on building core skills. It is not rocket science. As long as you go step by step, you're going to be able to build those core skills. Visualization. 
visualize the conclusion, visualize the argument, pre-think, and, and, and then do falsification. Make sure you understand this. Pre-thinking is not rocket science. Okay. And 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 if you can use pre-thinking to achieve two things. One is accuracy, the second is efficiency. Okay. Now, in terms of next steps, make sure you go through these. This is something which is available to you as a part of the free trial. Introduction to assumption, logical gap, two entities. As you go through this, you're gonna find the same method being taught to you in a much more granular fashion. If you like this, you're gonna love these concepts. If you like the session, you're gonna love these concepts. Okay, you have some of these here as well. By the way, this is probably 5% of all content that we have in CR, or actually even less than that. So just to tell you the kind of depth that we go through. Okay, if you are already an EG Math student, make sure you go through this in a step-by-step -step fashion. Okay, you go through the foundation file. Some of you couldn't even understand the conclusion in, in, in the tenured professor's question. You learn what are the various aspects of an argument in these files. Then go through each module. Those of you who couldn't understand what a statement said, our inference module te teaches you all about statements. Okay. In each of the core module, you get app concept files, app concept quizzes, which means you get feedback on every concept file that you go through, feedback on every application file that you go through, feedback on every practice quiz that you go through. Okay, and, and use that personalized feedback. Then with regards to, you know, how comprehensive this is with regards to EGMAT practice questions, you have a total of more than 500 full and practice questions in, in, in the offering. Okay. The other nice thing about this is you don't just learn concepts and, 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 and learn all the concepts and then do practice, which is what you do in most books. We teach you concepts, we make you practice those concepts, we teach you application, we make you practice that application right then and there. And then at each point you get feedback that is personalized to your ability. Okay. And just to really tell you how this works over here, think of this is what our assumption module looks like. Now, this is the paid part, just an assumption. And each of these entities is a is a is a video lesson which is about 35 minutes long okay and each in each of these you have assessments which give you feedback so you you learn the basic concepts which is what you have in the free trial then you learn level one concepts. so we teach you not just the basics of assumption but how do you apply pre-thinking in, in in arguments that have logical gaps in arguments that compare two entities in arguments where you have different segments of a, of a single entity and, and in arguments where you have comparison and quant focused argument. Okay, then we teach you, teach you how to apply this. But by the way, that application as, uh, uh, instruction will automatically start over here. This is level two application that we do, which means questions get more complex. And then we evaluate you at, again, purely without handholding. So this is evaluation with handholding. This is evaluation without handholding. And then if you still need official questions to practice form, we, we tell you, give you questions over here. But most people would not. So how do you get a 100 plus point score improvement? Or how do you achieve 90th percentile in, in, in critical reasoning? Use pre-thinking. Do not time yourself. Learn visualization. Focus on understanding the conclusion. Okay. And use the feedback that's given to you when you a lot of people are used to starting using a book then and, and one of the things that they really struggle with is hey i'm given feedback do i use it or not use that feedback why because it's only when you get precise at elemental levels is, is when you get to that 90th percentile ability there's a reason why a 90th percentile ability is a 90th percentile ability only 10 percent of the people reach that it's not because the others are not smart it's because they don't use feedback okay and just to tell you how comprehensive this is if you just purely look at not even the learning but purely the lessons you're going to find at least 6x as comprehensive as the next best resource 
again everything that you need is here and with that i'd like to end this webinar i'll share some success stories of people who've gone above and beyond what i've talked about as anupriya an isb admit improved from v32 to v46 which is 99 percentile and verbal in about 20 days if i remember correctly yes okay guys with that um i'd like to thank you guys for uh, uh, for joining me today how can you register for the next set of sessions um, but uh, let me just share that with you and if i can get some feedback on on, on the short answer part that'd be great so we have the algebra session tomorrow uh here is the algebra session you can click on register now Again, if you like this tomorrow's session, you're gonna love this. It's gonna be way more fast paced. Okay, and then we have a strategy webinar which is next week over there. You can click on register now to 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 really do that for either one. And okay. Will there be more questions? Every session is like that, or or our, our, our GMAT online and verb uh, course is, is very much like this. And for the GMAT strategy webinar, here is the link to, to GMAT strategy webinar over here, which is appearing in your in the Q&A pod right now. Also, we have the session with Seher, who's the marketing manager at, at, at mba.com or, or, or for, for graduate management admission council. Um, uh, so that's on Monday. If you've not registered for this one, make sure you register for for this one as well. And again, you can download the PDF at the bottom right hand corner over here. Aaron says, "How can we score V38? Will answering all easy and medium questions allow uh, for that? No, for V38, you will have to answer a good chunk of hard questions." Okay, so um, so yeah, you will need to do that. So, any other question, guys? And thank you for that feedback. You'd like to know the enrollment process? So write to me at rajat.edashima.com. You can. I mean, most people just buy the courses from the online link. But if you need to know anything more about it you can write to me and 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 someone from the team will will get back to you so but but most people just buy a course from here Diva says, I'm a first year BBS student, so I'm planning to apply for deferred MBA programs. I have no idea how to go about GMAT prep. Do you have any suggestions? So, Diva, first take a Sigma X mock. And then book a slot with one of our, uh, one of our GMAT strategy consultants. So, so, that's probably the best way because you'll get us you'll walk away with a study plan uh, and and here is the link to to do that i i think i don't know if there are any free slots available because they usually are fairly tight but i can see we do have a few available on monday i think sunday everything's booked we just have one available monday we still have about five of, or six available Tuesday we have about six available too. Yeah. So, so yeah, about eighty percent of these have have been taken. Charan says I'm planning to give my GMAT in the next thirty days for uh, because I'm planning to apply to Ross Booth and Kellogg part time. Okay, you need a seven uh, twenty score. So Charan, are you in the US already? If you are applying to apply for these school to these schools part time, okay. Do you have a green card already? Okay. Um, you are on, uh, okay. All right. All right. So so yeah. I mean, um, 
and 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 for part time programs, I mean, forgive me because uh, it's been some time since I uh, reviewed their part time programs. But but do they allow you to uh, uh, to to really just uh, I mean because Ross Kellogg uh, they're not exactly next to one another. The Ross is about five hours drive from Kellogg. So so do they allow you to 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 essentially just participate in the programs on the weekend from a location standpoint? Oh yeah. Okay, if your company supports, that's great. Then aim for a score of seven ten. You should be good for both Ross and 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 Kellogg. So so yeah, perfect. Yeah, if your company supports it, nothing like this. There are very few companies who, who support this. Most of them are in Silicon Valley. Uh, but yes, you're lucky if your company still supports it. When I did my MBA, a lot of companies did support uh, doing an MBA, but but these days, that that's more of an exception rather than a norm. In your typical GMAT score, I would say uh, a 720. Uh, let me actually share some stats with you. Uh, here is. Is a blog article that we wrote. Frankly, we've written such articles and many more for all B schools that are out there. Um, average score for top MIM college colleges. Let me just do give you. You can go from this article over here. Okay, and 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 I think this article should have quite a few links. Three year uh, two thousand seven. So ISB, I would say, is is a very. Uh, let me just. We have a lot of students who go to ISB, uh, and so I can share. But a few articles and uh, and and also uh, stuff around ISC uh, ISB admission essays, um, and and here is where you here if you go into go at this uh, go and look at this article you'll hear from the admissions director uh, at ISB uh, over there. So at ISB, uh, what 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 matters is is excellence, and they look at excellence in your. Um, Either in your professional career or through your GMAT. So if your GMAT is going to be your your um, your evidence of excellence, then aim for a 760. If your professional career isn't that great, if your professional career is is is, is what I would call as uh, uh, good, uh, above average, uh, given professional uh, career of all students in who coming from who come from your background, and in that case. A GMAT of 720 would suffice. So it just depends on what do you think your GMAT uh, is going to represent to ISP. Will you get the recording? Yes, you'd get the recording in about uh, about eight hours. It will be in your mailbox. Also, it will be there on our, 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 uh, our YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you should do that um, over here. Yeah, here's the link to our YouTube channel. Kaushal says, Kushal, sorry, not Kaushal, being from a small retail business experience, what's required to crap top B schools? I mean, I hardly have polished corporate experience. You don't necessarily need polished corporate experience. What you need is, 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 is uh, an experience where you made a difference. And uh, and and so if you can prove as to whether you made a difference, you'd be able to to get to to top B schools. Um, again, when you go look at videos in on on our um, uh, 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 on on our uh, YouTube channel, you can really see students who uh, who've gotten into uh, top B schools. Um, here's an example of a of a guy who. Uh, who's gotten into uh, 
uh, Tuck and Kellogg, with, with a decent um, background as well as a decent uh, uh, GMAT score. And again, we have videos from current students as well. Uh, let me just share some of those with you. Just give me one second. Here's someone who got into London Business School, and, and she's from a very non-traditional uh, background over here. To keep working and put those So, um, and we have tons of these on our YouTube channel. What score would you need to get into any deferred program? If you're going to apply to an M7 deferred program on an ISB, I would say at least a 750. Why? Because when, when you're applying to a deferred program, most likely you do not have professional experience, which means your GMAT score is probably going to account for a much higher proportion of, of uh, your application. Is 10 years of experience suitable uh, uh, for an executive MBA uh, such as IAMs? Yes, it is. Yes, and we've had students who've uh, gone. Uh, the kind of GMAT score they look for is about 720. It's not 750, 760, it's 720 or so. When will the application process for ISB IAM start this year? I would say very soon, very, very soon. Um, I know there are some delays because of COVID, but it will start very soon. And and, and in, in round one, all of these schools expect unprecedented demand. Hamid says I'm already in mid 30. Should that be holding? Should that hold my? Uh, should that be an, have an impact on my my admissions? Uh, yes and no, Hamid. Uh, and let me just tell you. Let me share an article over here. And uh, and we have many such articles, uh, which this article links to. But essentially, uh, the principle here is if you are 30 years or older, if you have 8 years of experience. The, the the answer to the question why MBA, regardless of whether your school's asking that specifically, uh, becomes really important because the schools need to know why an MBA at this stage of your career uh, uh, is is the right thing for you. So 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 that's really important for you. Okay, as long as you can prove that. I have had students who've got who've been 35, 36 years of age, and they've gotten into top B schools. Uh, three years ago, I visited um, UCLA Anderson, the the oldest student in their uh, uh, in the full time MBA class was 47 years old, and it made good sense for them to do for him to do an MBA. All right, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. It was great having you on board. Remember, we have the Algebra webinar tomorrow, the webinar with GMAC on um, on Monday, and, and again, you also have all uh, the, the prerequisites that you need to go through in the free trial. So go through them, and I look forward to seeing you on eGMAC.com.